first thing you do, obviously get to a, a safe spot, somewhere where you're not gonna get uh, injured uh, or hurt or crash into a second time. Uh, and then that's when you would like to take pictures. Like I've had a uh, client uh, perfectly do that before. I've had clients that they would not take any pictures. So you're kind of out of luck at that point. But at, at that point, the best evidence you're gonna have of your car accident is the pictures that you're gonna take on scene because it's highly likely that even the police uh, who will show up will not take pictures of the incident. In fact, they'll just do some sort of report. Um, so with that in mind, the second thing I would do is call the police, uh, have them get to the scene of the accident. Because if you don't call the police, there will be no report of the accident. There will be no report of the incident. It'll just be your word traveling out there and insurance companies aren't gonna take it as seriously. Uh, even if you're injured or even if, you know, maybe one or two days down the road or a week down the road, you're like, man, my back is killing me. I'm, I'm sore, my shoulder, my hip, whatever it is. Uh, you know, you, you, if you didn't file a police report, if you didn't call the police immediately, you're not going to have any of that information to show um, what damage has occurred. And they're going to create some sort of uh, uh, kind of scene reconstruction, if you will. Um, so that's very helpful. Uh, our police report right now, okay? So almost every police report in a crash case, like a, a, a personal injury vehicular accident, for instance, most common police report, most common personal injury claim, they're going to do some sort of reconstruction. Now, every type of police department does the reconstruction different. Some are more detailed than others. For instance, the Missouri Highway Patrol, in my opinion, they do higher quality of job more times than not than some of the local municipalities. Sometimes sheriff departments, more resources or more training on it. So you're going to see a better police report. You're going to see a more detailed diagram. On some of these, it'll just look like basically like stick figure type stuff. I mean, they probably have like a little car, which you can see here, and then maybe a road. But if you look at this one, they have, uh, this is a pretty detailed crash report. So you can see, you know, the location, uh, the road, west outer road 55. And then you have like this right here, which would indicate a uh, crash, right? A circle with an X, and then you have your vehicles listed, vehicle number one, vehicle number two. Uh, in this instance, my client would have been vehicle number uh, vehicle number one there. Vehicle number two would have been the car that caused the accident by flying in on the highway and crashing into them at a stop light area. You can see a red light signal here, a red light signal here. This is kind of an intersection right there. And so what you'll see is when they collide here, you can see two incoming here, two incoming here, crash here, two ends up about there, and one gets propelled forward approximately uh, nine feet from the curb, right? So you can like read the symbols and you can kind of get a rough estimate based on what the officer is taking down notes wise. And they go, they literally go back into this and reconstruct it. So when we get a police report like this, uh, with reference to, you know, like the actual reported information, there's kind of a narrative of what happened. They'll take the witness's statement, like if they'll take my client's statement here in, uh, in vehicle one, they'll take client's statement in vehicle two, if they're, if both of them are not unconscious, obviously, or, or something like that, or not, they're not rushed off to the hospital. Um, and they'll get a narrative, they'll mash it up. So let's say in this instance, uh, the police report would say something like that on a, on a different page. It would say something like, vehicle one was stopped at a red traffic signal on Route M at West Outer Road 55 when vehicle two uh, was distracted driving uh, and did not stop in time and hit vehicle one at a high rate of speed, propelling vehicle one several feet forward into the intersection, right? And then it's going to say something like, Vehicle two did not uh, see vehicle one there, or they admitted fault or something like that. So you're going to get some indication that somebody's at fault in, in something like this. Now, that doesn't ever always happen. Sometimes you get a police report where you'll have kind of a diagram. Let's say it's uh, vehicle one here and then vehicle two like coming uh, southbound here, right? And there's a traffic light, and it'll say, uh, vehicle one, 
So the driver of vehicle one stated that they were going through the green light. The driver of vehicle two stated that they had the green light and a collision occurred, right? So at that point, uh, it'll be crucial to make sure that you talk to any witnesses that are at the scene to see what they saw. And that way they can give their version of events in addition to just your word versus the word of the person that hit you. Because they might have a motive to lie and say that they didn't do anything wrong so that they don't have to pay, right? Uh, so that's just an example of what the police report looks like and why you should make one because it's very detailed. The insurance companies, it, it comes off in kind of bit of what is a bit of a checklist. They want to know, is there a police report? Did you get hauled off to the emergency room or did you just, you know, uh, say you were hurt or, you know, take some ibuprofen? I mean, if you were in an accident, you had, a, had the police call, they did a report, you're at the emergency room and you followed up with your doctor, that's a standard, what I would consider to be a good accident uh, transition claim in a motor vehicle accident case. What if you don't feel um, your injury until like the next day? That's, that is not something that I would consider uh, prohibitive of uh, a car accident type personal injury case. What the insurance companies are looking at particularly is what they call and what I, this is not legal terminology, this is insurance terminology, uh, treatment gap, right? So there's no law on treatment gap, no particular law on it anyway. It's not, it's not a legal term, but insurance companies look at it to mitigate their risk. They're like, all right, how far away is the treatment from your injury, right? You get injured and all, you get hit in a car accident uh, and you don't go to the doctor for two months they are not gonna pay for that claim or they're gonna try not to pay for that claim or at the very least give you way less than it would otherwise be worth. So if your question is, if your question is, what if you're hurt the next day, then the answer to that question is go to the doctor the next day or the next day after that or the next week. I mean, you're still in a pretty good time frame, right? These, these injuries and in motor vehicle accidents, particularly you know, soft tissue type, and I say soft tissue meaning no broken bones or fractures that are apparent, right? Your back, your neck are sore, uh, your shoulders sore, that type of stuff, maybe some headaches. I mean, these are real common actual injury, uh, injuries that occur one, two, three days later, a week later after a car accident, and they can persist. So you shouldn't feel like you are now prohibited from seeing a doctor. I mean, the best thing you could do is call a lawyer and be like, hey, here, here's what's going on. They're going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you. You need to go see a doctor. But then I guess the third step, as I described in reference to the police report, is to gather names and witnesses and phone numbers. Ideally, what should happen if you can call the police immediately from the scene is that the police should hopefully do a good job and collect those witness names and that information. I am here to tell you that that is not always the case. I have, again, cases sometimes for instance the highway patrol that have done a great job you know i've got a bus accident case where they got 13 different witnesses and phone numbers on there i mean they got everybody's name and phone number on there right and then you got other cases that they're like they didn't even try the police didn't even try and so you know to that end it's important that you seek out somebody maybe if it's just one person that saw the event especially that saw the event the way you saw it so that if you have their phone number, we can follow up with them. And it's okay to say, hey, do you mind if I follow up with you, you know, just in case I need to in the future? Uh, you'll find that a lot of times witnesses are like, yeah, that's, that's fine because, you know, they don't want this person to be able to wiggle out of it later, right? They saw what they saw, and there's some sense of justice, and a lot of witnesses are like, yeah, please call me, you know, you'd be surprised other driver's information that's insurance information phone number email uh all the stuff that you need right don't 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 miss that opportunity uh if you are in a situation where you don't think that you need to file a police report again i think that the police should be called if it's you know not your fault you should make sure that it's documented but in the case that that's not going to happen 
you know, you have to get the other person's information. You have to get their insurance information. You have to get their phone number. I would say get their email as well. As simple as, you know, asking them what happened or you're saying, you know, why did you run the red light or, or whatever, and they'll give some explanation, right? I've had clients literally record the entire interaction the second they got out of the car. They got hit hard. I can think of one particular client got hit hard at the intersection. A uh, uh, guy pops out. I mean, he's just sitting there like, oh, my gosh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happened. I just wasn't paying attention. And all of a sudden, I was trying to make the turn, and I didn't. And, I mean, the guy was potentially on drugs, potentially drunk, right? So that's, that's kind of the idea of recording or getting a statement of the other person. Again, ideally, what you're going to get is a police officer that's going to stand there, uh, perhaps two police officers, one's taking your statement, one's taking the other statement, and then you don't even have to worry about it. That's why police, uh, the police report and calling the police comes first, because that's ideally what's going to happen. Is there any time in a, in a car accident situation that you don't need a lawyer? I would say that in fact, it is probably true that most car accidents that happen do not require true legal help, especially if you get some of the basics down, right? You know, person call me and they're, they're like, hey, I got in a car accident. And I'm saying, well, were you injured? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, how much damage is done to your car? Very little, you know, very little damage at all, right? You're just trying to talk to the insurance company about the damage to your car. If it's over a couple hundred dollars or whatever, and it's just a car damage issue and there's no injury at all, it's, that's the type of situation that's really, you're probably not going to have a lawyer involved, right? And that's that could be the majority of the car accident. A majority of the high impact car accidents and even some low impact car accidents that have injuries involved, thinking about making a, a claim to the insurance company, then you should hire a lawyer because you're going to be way better off in my opinion, right? So anytime you have, if you're hit hard, yeah, a lot of people think to themselves, well, I'm not really that hurt, right? Or like, I'm not immediately hurt. The people, the, the tough guys out there, right? Tough guys and gals, I you get them all the time. And they're like, I'm, I'm all right. I'm just bruised up. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're bruised up. You got hit at 20 miles per hour. No kidding. You know, your car is designed, especially the newer cars are designed to absorb some of that impact, but some of it's going right through you. And so it is, there's no question. If you're going to get hit 20 miles per hour, you're pretty much going to have some sort of at least soft tissue injury or damage to your spine, your lumbar spine, or your cervical spine, which is in your neck, lumbar in your lower back, cervical in your neck. Highly unlikely that you're not going to have some sort of underlying issue, right? So it's, it's worth looking at making sure you're able to get the right medical treatment and get it paid for. You know, the, the all their medical treatment paid for and the highest amount of money in their pocket typically is when the photographs show uh, or video show the extent of the damage, right? I mean, your car is crushed up. You went to the emergency room and they showed fractures or surgical, all right? You know, that's the highest value of cases uh, down to soft tissue or, you know, lumbar, lower back, cervical, neck uh, damage, such as, with, you know, cervical disc bulges, for instance, like a, a alignment of your back is messed up all the way down to just soft tissue aches and pains. So, but even if you get in a relatively low impact case, you're, you can still have extensive damage done to your, for instance, cervical spine, which is the, the most likely even in low impact cases, but even in your lumbar lower back. And I have cases where somebody was hit probably in, a, in excess 15 miles per hour around that, and you're thinking, well, 15 miles per hour, it's not like they're just plowing through, you know, it's not 30, 40 miles per hour, or it's not a full speed collision on the highway. But, you know, if your neck is turned and you get like a whiplash, it's no surprise to see that person go into the doctor and they're like, I'm in a lot of pain. And uh, they have, you know, disc bulges here, 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 right? Uh, meaning that there's abnormalities that are causing pain in their cervical spine. And so the question is not really, although it's portrayed this way, the question is not really, 
how bad the action, the question is, what, how bad is the liability, then how bad are the damages? So it's really, if it's not at all your fault, even though they didn't hit you as hard as possible, it's still their fault. That's the question. Is it their fault? Yes or no? All right. The answer is yes. Now, how much damages were caused by that? I spend more time talking to clients about because at the end of the day, you're going to get in a typical car accident injury case, you're going to get a situation where you can settle your case or you can file a lawsuit, right? A lot of people do not really want to file a lawsuit. Like people would rather get paid for their, you know, for their injury and for the trouble and get their medical treat, treatment paid, then go through the trouble of filing a lawsuit. You might not get anything for a year. You might not get anything at all, right? Depends when you can get a jury trial. Because at the end of the day, a lawsuit is, is just a piece of paper that gets you a chance to sit in front of a jury of 12 people and be like, here's what happened to me. I'm injured or I was injured even in some circumstances. And here's how much you should uh, pay, right? And so it's all a risk. It's kind of a risk reward situation. Um, and every case is different. In more circumstances than not, I'd say I can't put a percentage on it, but let's say 90%. It's going to end up being better to take the settlement if it's fair. If it's fair and reasonable and we've negotiated a good settlement, it's something that I advise my clients on and I'll tell them, look, I take it or no, that's just, in my opinion, not worth enough selling yourself way too short, right? You know, like let's use a, an example of we're at in the settlement negotiations where the policy of $50,000, our demand for the settlement is the full policy of $50,000. They're saying we won't, we'll pay you less than 10, right? Okay. We're just very far apart. Right. And that's sometimes when you see lawsuits is when you're just so far apart on the numbers and you're looking at your case and going, we have a good case. There's not a great chance that you're going to lose. I think you should go forward. Most clients you'll find would be happier with a settlement. But if you're asking me, I'm just going to give you the best advice. I'm going to tell you, you know, this will probably make you happier. It will be done now. You're not going to have to wait a year or whatever. But for me, frankly, you know, I love trying cases, happy to maximize the potential on many of the cases and uh, really, really fight for my clients. So if, if your question to me is, do I think everybody sh should settle or the, are settlements always better or more like more likely to be better? N not necessarily true, right? Um, but I find that clients like to settle cases and I will do whatever the client likes and whatever is best for them. And we do not charge for a car accident case if you are injured in a car accident, right? We work on what's called a contingency fee based, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, it's almost like commission basis, like fully entirely on commission. That's kind of the idea. That, that being that we go recover the most money we can for you. And then we take what is typically in most circumstances, one third of the amount of the recovery. Okay. So cost nothing up front. We spend it all. And it does cost money to, to uh, take on these claims, to collect evidence, and then to litigate uh, the stuff if we have to file a lawsuit or whatever it may be. And so it costs money. It costs time. It, it comes at no cost to the client until, you, until we win, until we get the recovery. And then one third of it typically goes to uh, our law firm. And then the two thirds of it, the rest of it goes to the client. Right. And in some circumstances, there's uh, medical bills that are paid as well. Uh, so that pays off your medical bills, pays off any what you call liens, uh, medical liens you might have. And um, that's pretty much how it usually the lawyer does for you is they negotiate on behalf of the insurance or on behalf of you against the insurance company. A kind of a follow up question to that would be, what's the benefit of having a lawyer compared to doing it yourself? And I've, saw, I've seen a lot of people through internet commenting and stuff like that. They're like, just skip the um, lawyers. You can do it yourself. Well, that is entirely possible. And 
Perhaps some people have had really bad experiences with some law firms, and I can't speak to what types of law firms those are that have handled cases that would make people want to do it themselves. But I can also tell you that if you're doing it right, you're going to look at yourself and be like, oh my gosh, that was difficult. The, the, the level of difficulty in actually, even before a lawsuit, is lawyer level. I mean, you're not going to appropriately collect uh, the right medical records, give the and do it under correct legal advice, and present a claim to the insurance company. Let's say you're able to do all those things, which is pretty difficult to do in, in its own uh, regard for most injury claims. Uh, now, the insurance company is looking at you like, all right, this is great. You know, our job, my job as the insurance adjuster is to keep our costs down. And that means paying you less and you have no lawyer. So you're not going to have any idea how much that your case is worth. If you don't like it, I'm going to tell you too bad, so sad. And you're going to be like, oh, gosh, OK, I guess I'll take it, you know, because you can't buy a lawsuit and win. Right. So kind of the premise behind it is if you have a lawyer, they know that they're will that you're willing to fight them and you you can adequately do it. That's the kind of ammo you have. If you don't, you're just a single person trying to do your best and they're licking their chops thinking they're going to spend a lot less money on you. I think the impression is among a lot of people that really aren't what I would call litigious people. Like they're not really inclined to file lawsuits or get lawyers, you know, they're like, gosh, I'm going to have to sue somebody, which that's kind of the first good job the insurance companies have done. They've really kind of cast this, this, grim view of lawyers that like you're going to have to go after somebody. But the truth of the matter is almost all circumstances, it's just like you're going to collect from an insurance company and you're probably not going to ever have to buy a lawsuit. Like I said, perhaps 90%, I don't know, a large number of cases settle, especially car accident cases, settle without a lawsuit. I don't want that to be the impression that, yeah, you're never going to have to buy a lawsuit. You file a lawsuit when they're not going to pay you enough money, right? When I get that case and I give it to them and I say, you should pay this much. And uh, they go, no way. We're going to be way down here. And I, I tell my client, let's go, let's go get them.